Now, as Keith mentioned, we're starting a new series, Meals with Jesus. I don't know what that makes you think of. I wonder, who was the last person that you sat down to a meal with? Can you remember? Or, or who was the last person who invited you round to their house for a meal and you uh, accepted the invitation? The, re- the reason I ask is because I think meals are really significant. Uh, they can tell you a lot about a person, uh, who a person chooses to eat with, how they choose to eat, where they eat, what they eat. These things are significant. They actually tell you a great deal. I mean, think about it. Who would you sit down to a, to a grande, skinny caramel latte with a Danish pastry on the side with? Who, who would you sit down to that meal with? Probably not just a random person that you picked out of uh, the, the queue in Starbucks. I doubt it. It would probably be your friend, someone that you like, someone that you enjoy spending time with. You take this moment out of your week to, to share what's going on, to, to talk about your lives, uh, to share stories. Or late in the evening, when, when you sit down around the, the meal table to a banquet of fish fingers and uh, spaghetti hoops and potato waffles, and, and the person opposite you is overdosing on tomato ketchup. Who is it? It's probably your kid, maybe your husband, I don't know. And you're gathered around this meal table. And it's significant because it's there that you talk about what's gone on during the day. You share your fears. You share the exciting things, the achievements. You talk about what's been going on in your life. You, you build your relationships with people around a meal. How about in the summer, the balmy summer evenings? They will come, I promise you. And you're, you're standing there, beer in one hand, a uh, pair of barbecue tongs in the other hand, flipping sausages and burgers. You have an embarrassing novelty apron around your waist. You're lamenting the fact that England has been kicked out of yet another major sporting tournament. But you're not there alone as you barbecue. Your mates are there. You you share this with them as you eat. Are they cooked all the way through or aren't they cooked all the way through chicken drumsticks? You sit there together and you build community. You talk about the bad things, the good things. You laugh, there's banter, you joke with each other and it's a community building thing. What about if you find someone attractive? What do you do? I'm aware there are many ways you could answer that question, but one thing you could do is ask them to go to a meal with you. You could make a reservation at Little Italian, a a nice quiet table for two in the corner, and and we've all seen Lady in the Tramp, haven't we? A a bowl of spaghetti shared together and nothing is ever the same again. A a meal changes things. It's there that we build relationships. What I want to say is that meals are more than just eating. Okay? It's not just where you go to get your intake of calories and protein and, and carbohydrates and things like that so that you don't drop dead. That, that's not what a meal is. It's far more. Meals are significant. Community is built. Relationships grow. Friendships are nurtured around the meal table. And so we're going to spend some time, seven weeks in the book of Luke, looking at meals that Jesus shared with people. And it's funny, meals are a massive part of Luke's gospel. I don't know if you've ever noticed it. Maybe if you were going through it in Read 260 a little while ago, you would have seen how frequently Jesus eats with people. Tonight we're in chapter 5, but go to chapter 7, go to chapter 9, go to chapter 11, or chapter 10, I missed out. Chapter 14, chapter 19, chapter 22, chapter 24. In all of those um, situations, Jesus sits down to eat with people. And besides those, uh, the book is full of of metaphors about food, uh, stories and parables about hospitality. To give you one example, think about the the story of the prodigal son. Towards the end, what happens? You have the son who's run off and squandered his, his father's money. He's completely disgraced his family. He's come back and they share a meal together. The dad kills the fattened calf. They they celebrate together, and everyone is gathered in for this banquet, this feast. And we read earlier that the son is hungry, but this meal isn't just about filling his stomach. This meal says something. It says that the father accepts him. It says that the father loves him. It says that the father welcomes him back, that he's part of the family again. Meals are significant. They were so in the book of Luke, and they were at that time generally. You may be aware of um, a group called the Pharisees. I'm sure if you've been through Sunday school, you can't have missed them. The Pharisees were people for whom meals were really important. The, the reason is, I mean, maybe you know this about the Pharisees, but they were waiting for someone to come back, God's promised Messiah, to rescue them. Their predicament was that Rome, the Roman Empire, was occupying their country and, and was spoiling it, really. They, they wanted independence, they wanted freedom, they wanted redemption. And they expected God to bring it because he promised to. 
But their idea of how they brought this on, how they sped it up and ushered it on, was that they kept themselves pure, or they thought so. So on top of all the, all the laws in the Old Testament, look at books like Leviticus, and they're full of laws to do with purity and stuff. On top of that, the Pharisees added on layer upon layer upon layer of more and more purity laws. And so things like how you prepared your food and what food you ate and the people that you ate your food with and how you washed your hands before you ate, these things became really, really significant to the Pharisees. So for them, mealtimes were not just about showing who you liked and who you didn't like by an invitation or, or who you cared about and who you were um, apathetic towards. It wasn't just about showing who was in the in crowd and who was outside of that. It was all of that, I think, like it is today. But as well as that, for these Pharisees, what it was about was purity before God and redemption for their nation. It was a big deal what you did around the meal table. Etiquette was important. Now, we're going to look uh, at the first of our passages, the first of our meals, and it comes in the book of Luke, chapter 5, and we're picking it up at verse 27. So if you'd like to find that in your Bibles, that would be really helpful, and just keep it open for the time that I'm speaking. Um, if you haven't got a Bible with you, don't worry, it's up on the screens. And we're just going to read through part by part and see how this story teaches us something from this meal experience with Jesus. So as I said, chapter 5 of Luke, verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Now we'll get to the meal in just a second. I'm just going to pause there for a few moments and talk about that a little bit. Now, now here we find a character called Levi. And I think in this little section, there are two really striking, two really shocking things that happen. There may be more. Perhaps you can find a third. But, but two things I want us to talk about. The first is this character Levi himself. He was a, a tax collector. And again, if you've been through Sunday school, if you've done the syllabus, you'll probably know tax collectors are the baddies as well as the Pharisees. But, but maybe you don't understand why. Perhaps you do. I don't know. This could be revision. The, the tax collectors, um, like some others, had sided with the Romans. So as I said, back in Jesus' day, their country wasn't their own. It, it was over, overrun by these Romans. They ruled. They were in charge. And, and you can see Levi does a little job. He sits in his tax booth. Uh, he probably collects tolls as people go through from one place to another, a bit like you would in the Seven Bridge. We've got Peter Baker coming to visit us. He'll have to pay to go back to Wales, won't he? That's the way it works. Um, and, and as he goes through the bridge, he'll have to pay um, a toll. And Levi's job was similar. He wasn't a very important tax collector. Um, find someone like Zacchaeus, he comes later, chapter 19, and he's a chief tax collector. He's a bit more se senior. But Levi's just this regular bloke who works for the Romans. But there's real significance in that. As I said, there were these promises that God was going to rescue his people. And, and, and many, like the Pharisees, were clinging on to them, and, and they were living for those promises. They were hoping for, for God to come back and rescue his people. They were hoping that God would save them. But Levi, it seems, has given up on his people and he's decided to side with the Romans. He'd rather have a safe, cushy job with them and earn a good wage than, than side with his people. It's a real betrayal here. He is a traitor. And, and I was trying to think of a modern-day equivalent of this, or fairly modern, in our situation. I struggled a little bit. But, but I was thinking, perhaps, tell me if I'm wrong, but, but for those of you who lived through the Second World War, um, you've got the whole nation pulling together, everyone playing their part to defeat a, a common foe, to defend our freedom, our liberty, to defend it for our children. Th this is what was going on in, in the Second World War. But perhaps you were aware, I don't know, of some people who were using it for their own gain. They, they were profiteering. They were selling stuff on the black market. They were making a killing, and by the end of the war, when everyone else is on short rations and struggling to, to feed their families, these people have got bank accounts that are bursting at the seams. Now, you see someone like that, and how do you feel when everyone is tightening their belts for the cause? You don't feel great, do you? And I wonder if Levi was a similar, would have, would have arisen kind of similar emotions in the people that saw Levi. Here was someone who wasn't on our side. He'd given up on us. He, he wasn't interested in us. He'd sided with the Romans. 
Beside that, you know that the, the tax collectors used to um, use their influence, they used to use their position to, to, to cream a little bit off for themselves. If they were charging £6.50, is that about what it is for the bridge to get across the Wales, something like that? Then they would bump it up to £10. And, and you couldn't really do anything about it because there were Roman guards on every corner ready to chop your head off with a sword or something or arrest you, I don't know, if you, if you stepped out of line. Levi had his back covered so he could do what he wanted and the Romans turned a blind eye to it. So people didn't like him. They despised him. He was horrible. He was an outcast. He was unpleasant. Beside that, you see what his friends are like in a little while. They were sinners. They were nasty people. So shock number one is that Jesus dares to even talk to him. Guilt by association. If Jesus is found speaking with this man, what are they going to think of Jesus? But he does. Jesus says to him at the end of verse 27, follow me. And in verse 28, here's where the second shock comes. And Levi, remember who he is, got up, left everything, and followed him. That's pretty shocking, isn't it? Let's just revisit this tax collector thing. I know I've laboured it a bit, but there's one perhaps most treacherous thing about Levi's character that we've missed. That God had made promises way back in the Old Testament that he would save his people. That God had said he would keep those promises. That God had asked of his people to trust him. And Levi has sided with the Romans. It's not just his people that Levi has stabbed in the back. God has tur- uh, sorry, Levi has turned his back on God. He said, when all the ships are down, I'm going to trust the Romans. I'm not going to trust you, God. If he were putting his eggs in a basket, they would be all in the Romans' basket. He's not interested in God's promises to save him, to redeem him, to redeem his country. He'd rather trust the Romans. A cushy job, the safety of the Roman army, perhaps Roman citizenship if he could get it, that's what he wants instead. He sided with them. And so it's a complete shock when this man, clearly a a sinner if you want to use that label, clearly uninterested in God, clearly made a lifestyle choice that doesn't win him many friends, decides that he is going to turn his back on all of that and follow Jesus. There must have been something so magnetic about Jesus' character, something so compelling about him that Levi was prepared to leave it all and follow him. And look at what he gives up. I mean, we're guessing a little bit here. But Levi leaves everything. He leaves the protection of Roman soldiers. Now, as a hated uh, person, probably having Roman soldiers to back you up is helpful. He leaves that protection that the Roman soldiers afford. He leaves all the money that is across his toll collector's booth. You know, a lot of that would have been his to take home and and stick in his pension fund or whatever. He leaves a, a safe and secure job. And he follows Jesus. He changes everything. His direction is turned around. Let's skip to the next scene, because there's kind of two scenes in this story. If you've got your Bibles, uh, look back at verse 29. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Okay, so so scene one was out in the marketplace or somewhere where where Levi had his tax collector's booth, where he's collecting his tolls. There are lots of people going past, and Jesus calls him. And then the the camera pans around to the second scene, and we're in Levi's house, and Jesus is there at a party. Now, now this, this seems shocking. This is probably shock number three, if you're counting. Levi is there. Jesus is there. Uh, we read Jesus' disciples are there, so there's a bunch of them. But the rest of the guests are Levi's friends. The, these are not the moral elite of, of, of the place. These are not um, acceptable people. These are, I guess, the moral underbelly of, of this town. These are the people that no self-respecting Jew would dare to even speak to, let alone touch, let alone go to a party with. And Jesus is there with them. Jesus is there in this party with them. You can imagine, he, he eats their food. He makes conversation with them. He laughs at their jokes. He compliments them. He, he chats with them. He builds up a rapport. He, he speaks with them. He drinks with them. Jesus is there with them. 
And you know, we talked about meals. I think there's something significant about this, even to us, even without the, the baggage that the Pharisees had. There's something significant that Jesus is happy to go in their house and sit down with them, to dance if they dance at these banquets, to talk, to eat. It's quite an intimate thing, isn't it, to be there with them. And the Pharisees, they look on, and they are absolutely blown away by this. This completely, they can't even understand this. They can't begin to understand this. I was trying to think of what it would look like in, in today's culture, and I don't think I got it right. I don't think I got close enough to the amount of shock that this would cause. But I, I was thinking, um, the, the new Archbishop of Canterbury, it's uh, Justin Welby, isn't it? And uh, I was imagining if he came down on the train with, with his friends, with John Sentamu and a few other guys from the Synod, and they were coming down for an evening out with their, with their new gay friends. And they go off to the Triangle, and uh, they've made friends with these people. They go to where these people go to party. And they're in and out of different gay bars and gay clubs, and they're chatting with these people, speaking to them. They're, they're talking about the things they want to talk about. They're, they're, they're chatting about stuff. This seems to be the kind of scene that we have here. The sort of people you would never expect a religious person to mix with. And not just mixing on their terms. Jesus doesn't call them to repentance by bringing them into a church to shout at them and tell them off. He goes to where they are. He goes in their house. And he parties like they party. Now I imagine that Jesus saw things that he was not happy about. I imagine there were things that he wasn't pleased with. I imagine as they ate and some of the food wasn't prepared in the way it should have been, or as they told jokes which were crude and unpleasant, or as they, people turned up and they arrived at the party dressed in a way that was so inappropriate. There were things which Jesus wasn't pleased about, I'm sure, in that party. But he was there with them. And the Pharisees don't get this. Remember what we said about them at the start before we um, turn to this passage. They were um, mad on purity laws. They thought that if they could be pure in everything they do, from who they mix with to who they eat with to how they prefer, prepare their food, what they eat, if they could get it all right, they could speed up the return of the Messiah. That's what they honestly thought. And so when they see Jesus, this supposed religious teacher, this possible Messiah, mixing with them, they cannot get their heads around it. Why is he with sinners like Levi? Doesn't he know? This, this is a PR nightmare that Jesus has decided to go to their house. This is crazy. And so you see what they say in verse 30. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples. Sorry, it's up on the screen now. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? They don't get it. You know, I think in, in, in their minds, I think what they would have expected, if Jesus really was the Messiah, was for him to sit down at their table, to eat with them, their very nice kosher food, to, to wash their hands in the way that they, sorry, for him to wash his hands in the way they wash their hands, to do all the things which they do. They expected Jesus to come to them on their terms and to be with them. But instead, from the way that Luke tells the story, it's almost as though they're on the outside, pressing their noses up to the windows, if they ever had panes of glass, which they didn't, looking through the windows. And, and the people on the inside are the, the, the ones you would expect on the outside. And those on the outside are the ones you'd expect on the inside. And this shocks them to their core. It completely blows them away. They can't believe it. It's interestingly, that word that Luke uses for complaint he says they complained, is held back in, in, in the writings of Moses, often to describe uh, the people of Israel when they're moaning at God with no good reason, when they complain at him, when they're wandering in the wilderness. This is the word that's used uh, when the Old Testament is translated into Greek. Uh, and Luke uses this word here to, to show that these Pharisees are no different. They're moaning at, at God, at God's plan, with no grounds for complaint. They've gone mad with their own sense of being right. Jesus is eating with these sinners. And they ask him the question, and Jesus answers. Verse 31, if you're still with me in your Bibles. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus tells it to them in an illustration, then he tells it as straight as he can tell it. He describes himself as a doctor, and I love this image. It's, it's so vivid. If you had a doctor who never ever saw sick people, 
they would be a rubbish doctor, right? If, if their waiting room was full of really, really healthy people who came to, to show the doctor that they hadn't broken their leg or to show that they weren't coughing, that would be stupid, wouldn't it? And if the doctor never, ever went anywhere near an ill person or an unwell person or a hurt person, their doctoring would be useless, yeah? And Jesus says, that is me. I'm a doctor. I've come for people who are sick, not people who are well. If you think that the doctor comes for people who are well, you're stupid. That's what Jesus is kind of getting at here. It's pretty blunt. And in case they didn't get it, he spells it out in verse 32 as blunt as he can be. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You know, I think that word righteous, we could almost put those kind of ironic um, quote marks, couldn't we, around it? He hasn't come to call people who, who think they're righteous, people who, who reckon they've got it all sussed, who've got all the, the moral and religious boxes ticked. Jesus hasn't come for people like them. He has come for sinners, to call them to repentance. He's come for people who realize that they are not perfect. He's come for people who realize that along the way they've made mistakes. He's come for people who realize that if they were to come face to face with God, they would be doomed. And Jesus comes to them to offer hope. Jesus comes to them to offer grace. You know, we said that Jesus comes to them. He literally does. He's in their house with them, where they are, to offer grace to them. You know, th this little sentence here from Jesus tells us that the only people who are excluded from the grace of Jesus are those who think they don't need it. Everybody else is welcome, no matter what the past, no matter what the present, no matter what's going on, even what you might do in the future. No one is excluded from the grace of Jesus, but for thinking they don't need it. And that is good news, isn't it? That's a brilliant message that we have here. A Jesus who came not for the healthy, but for the sick, because I'm sick. And probably, I'm guessing, you're sick too. And Jesus comes for you. That's wonderful news. It's exciting news. Now, as we close, you can probably guess, if you've been to enough sermons, where I'm going. Jesus came for the sick, so we should go to the sick. Yeah? You saw that one coming, didn't you? That's, that's a classic preacher move, isn't it? And, and it's not a surprise, okay? Here it comes. It is pretty familiar. We should go to those who are sinners. We shouldn't just hang around in holy huddles. You, you could see it coming. The problem is, most of us here who've been to church more than a few times know it. But if you look at my life, and possibly yours, I'm not going to dare to judge you, but my life certainly, I don't practice it as much as I should. I asked you at the start, didn't I? Um, who was the last person you shared a meal with? Who was the last person who invited you around to dinner and you accepted and you went and had a nice meal with them? And the reason I ask that is because I think it's a really good litmus test of who we care about, of who we love, of who we are willing to accept, of who is important to us, of who matters to us. And I'm ashamed to say that as I've looked back, I've actually done this, thought back through the people that I've gone to dinner with, the people that I've invited around to my house, the people that I've shared meals with, I'm ashamed to say that it doesn't look anything like what Jesus does when he goes to a meal. That nine times out of ten, maybe even ten times out of ten, I share my meals with nice, middle-class, white, Christian, well-rounded, in comfortable circumstances, um, people like me, probably in their mid-twenties, no one too different. And as you look at Jesus and his meal habits, we'll see it as we go through the people who share his table, the tables that he's prepared to sit at. We see that he is sending a message loud and clear to the world around him, that he is happy to sit down with the sinners. He's happy to sit down with those who are unacceptable to others. He's happy to sit down to people who are broken. He's happy to sit down to people who've messed up, who are selfish, who are thoughtless. He's happy to sit down with any of them. He'll be at their table. He's not afraid to be tainted by association with them. He's not bothered by that because he loves them. The scary thing is for me that if you look at my history of who I've sat down to, to eat with, it tells a very different story. Probably looking at it objectively, it says that I like people who are like me. I'm not comfortable with people who are different. I'm not really all that bothered about people who don't know about Jesus, who are far away from him, who I'm not prepared to get to know. I'm just going to gently say, have a little look at your own meal schedules, the people you have around your table. What does it say? I was thinking about what people might say about Levi, that he is an outcast, that he's corrupt, that he's a sinner, 
that he's filthy rich, if you want to use that term. He's a traitor. He's selfish. He's unacceptable. We could say more. Now, in our setting, here we are in Bournemouth in the 21st century, mixing in with the people that we mix with, going through life in the way that we do. For you, just look at those, those categories we've got here. Who fits into those? As you see that word and you think of a person that springs to mind, who is it? Maybe it's not an individual. Maybe it's a kind of swathe of society, a demographic or something. But are there people that you think of when you see these? Are there people, actually, who subconsciously, even if you're not prepared to admit it to yourself, you would never have round to your house? You'd never dare open the door to them. You wouldn't sit them down at your table. You wouldn't break a piece of bread and have half with them and half for you. You'd never do that. Are there, are there people you can think of? Because I can. There are people that I'm not prepared to do what Jesus did for. And it's wrong. I think we need to ask ourselves then, why is this? Why is it that we struggle? Why is it that my table is almost exclusively populated by nice people who are like me and not by people that need to hear the gospel? Why is that? Is it because I'm afraid? Probably partly. Is it because I'm comfortable and I know those people and I like those people and I don't want to break from what makes me feel comfortable? Probably. Is it because I, I lack any love or compassion for those people? I think that one's probably true as well. well on the lack of love, I, I just want to bring up one specific. I was thinking, in this town, we have, um, we, we've mentioned the triangle and, and, and the gay bars that are up there. We have a huge gay community in Bournemouth. And I think this is a really massive mission field for the church because here is a, a huge part of society which is almost completely unreached by the gospel. What I mean by that is you talk to most gay people and they don't have a clue that Jesus would have sat down to a meal with them. They don't have a clue that Jesus loves them, that he doesn't just want to judge them. Actually, he wants to forgive them and free them, to liberate them and redeem them. They don't realize this. And I think probably for many of us, I'm as guilty as most of us here, we lack the love for these individual groups, for these people to bother to go and reach them. It's not easy, but we just lack the love to compel us to do it. And so I want us to think about this. Why don't we reach out to these people? I hope in your mind you now have individuals or people that you can think of, someone you pass on the street on your way to work, somebody who sits on your bus, somebody that you know a little bit about, a friend that you've lost contact with, I don't know, people who you realise you should have around your table, not just because then you can tick the box, but because it means something. To Jesus, sitting here, I think, meant that he accepted them, that he wanted to, to reach out to them, that he loved them. And when you invite someone to eat with you, it means something too. As we close, time is short, I'd like to just suggest a few practical things maybe that might help us in this area. First is to be honest with God. I think I wanted to put this up front. It's kind of what we've already started to do. Maybe as you've thought about these categories, there are people who spring to mind who you know that you are prejudiced against or people that you lack love for or people that you are fearful of. Talk to God about that. Ask him to mend your sinful heart. Ask him to, to change that, to warm your heart with love for these people. It's something he can only do. This doesn't happen naturally. I think naturally we recoil into our own little comfortable kind of pockets where we, where we are with people that we know. That, that naturally happens. But when we have the spirit of Jesus in us, something very different happens. So let's pray for him to, to change us. Let's, let's be honest with him and ask him to change us. Secondly, practically, revive old friendships. I heard a, a quote, and I'm really glad that I didn't write it down because I missed it, and I don't know the exact one, but I think I may be quoting him wrong. A guy called Steve Timmis, uh, who writes quite a few books, uh, with a guy called Tim Chester you may have heard of, uh, and he says this. He says that when a non-Christian becomes a Christian, on average, within two years, they have lost any meaningful contact with any non-Christian friends they had. That's a shocker, isn't it? I think the reason it's shocking is because it's often true. Within two years, a new born-again Christian has lost any meaningful contact with any non-Christian friends they had. They might say something over Facebook. They might occasionally meet up. But really, is the friendship alive? No. Suddenly, they're, they're surrounded by great things in church, but it, it pulls us away from the important people that we had friendships with in the past, the people that we need to still be having around our meal table. I can think of a lot of people who I just don't have the same contact with anymore, if any contact, because church and Christianity can suck you in and away from these things. And whilst church is important, 
We cannot lose contact with the people that matter. So maybe going away from here, all you think to yourself is, I know that one person that I could have around my meal table again. That I could say to them, you matter to me. That I could say to them, I love you. That, that actually me becoming a Christian hasn't meant that you've lost my friendship. But me becoming a Christian means that I can give you something in our friendship that is worth more than anything. So maybe have that person in your mind as you go away and be determined to strike up that friendship again. Don't treat people like projects. This is another one which I think is a problem. If you think to yourself, ah, oh, it's all right, I have a friend who's in the mafia and he's on the outskirts of things, so if I keep friendly with him, then that's great. I can tick the box, I'm doing what Jesus did, I'll have him around for dinner every few weeks uh, and I'll work on him till he becomes a Christian. That's no good, okay? Um, Jesus treated people like people. He, he treated Levi like a friend. He, he spoke to Levi's friends and got to know them. They were people to him, not projects, not evangelism projects that he was going to work on until they cracked and then he could celebrate. And if anyone brought up evangelism in a prayer meeting, he could arrogantly say that he had a friend who was coming to Christianity Explored or something like that. That's not what Jesus is about and neither should we be. We treat people like people. We love them like Jesus loved them. Almost finally, expand your horizons. I think as Christians, again, I've said this, maybe it's just my experience, but a lot of us... Uh, have a lot of Christian friends, we have a lot of um, interaction with people who are similar to us, but there's a world out there. I mentioned the gay community, which is almost not touched by the gospel, but there are many other communities, many other groups, many other demographics which just do not um, hear the gospel. There, there's nobody to go to them, there's no one to speak to them. And so it suggests that we think very carefully, I'm doing this as well at the moment, of how we can expand our horizons a bit. I don't know, you join a club, very simple. Maybe if there's a, a group that's at risk and you join a, a volunteer group so that you can help with them and work with those people that you're interested in, people that, that you care about. Um, a really helpful one, I thought, which somebody mentioned to me when I was uh, working as a teacher, is try to build friendships with people at work, outside of work. How many of us here have very superficial staff room kind of relationships with people? They're friends, you chat with them, you have good jokes and good times with them, but you'd never really see them outside of the office. Maybe think of ways that you can meet up with them and, and get to know them better outside of work. Really simple. But if we're going to have people around our meal tables like Jesus had around his meal table, we need to know people. We need to meet people. We need to go to the people who maybe think that God is out to, um, to judge them. And that's it. And we need to show them what Jesus has shown to us. That he is full of grace. And that is enacted in the meal table, isn't it? That's what we see in this passage. We don't see a Jesus who stands aloof, who's on his soapbox shouting at people and telling them what's wrong in their life. We see a Jesus who, interestingly, calls them to repentance. That sounds like soapbox language. But the way he does it is by meeting people, by sitting with them, by eating with them, by chatting and talking, sparking up friendships and getting to know them, demonstrating to them love, and then calling them to repentance. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? We're going to see six more meal tables with Jesus as we go through, and we'll see themes that develop. But for tonight, let's see a meal table of grace. A God who doesn't count our sins against us, but forgives us, and is willing to sit down with even the worst of us here. This is good news. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your love for the sinner. Thank you that though each of us are in the same boat as Levi, you call each of us to repentance. But the way that you do it is so kind. You send your son to sit with us, to be with us, to eat with us. Thank you so much that your son Jesus was not averse to mix, mixing with sinners. Thank you that he was prepared to sit down and not be afraid of being tainted by association. Thank you that he loved the lost, and he still does. Thank you that each of us, sinners though we are, is forgiven and accepted by your son Jesus. Thank you for all of your love and all of your goodness. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.